Whoa, g'day guys. Today, I'm going to be attempting to build some diffs for my FJ45 Land Cruiser, the strongest way possible for the average person with off the shelf parts. Cause I will be Before we get too stuck into building our new diffs, what I want to show you is first is a broken diff. This diff on the bench here, which is my donor diff, this is out of Mac Preston's Black 79. This differential is a custom built 4.88 ratio, built by a diff builder, not by Mac, and it has had a catastrophic failure. Mac was actually on tour at the time with his family over in South Australia. He rang me to say that he'd blown a diff. I built him a new diff and we sent it over to him and he put it in the car and it is still driving today. Anyway, before I get stuck into building my new diffs for Big Bad Baz, which is over on the hoist, what I want to do is have a little quick look at Mac's diff and just, you know, see what went wrong with it. So that's what I'm going to do first. Backlash feels good. Pinion feels good. Carrier bearings. Zero play. Locking tabs. Check. Carrier bolts. Check. Ring gear bolts. Ring gear bolts. Every single one of these ring gear bolts is loose and one is missing. That there is a crown wheel bolt, a ring gear bolt, whatever you want to call it. Should not be able to screw out with your fingers. Every single one is loose. I've just been on the phone to Mac to just confirm that he did not touch the ring gear bolt. Before I told him, I said, did you happen to undo any single thing on that like I asked? And he said, no, didn't touch a single thing. So you didn't touch any of the ring gear bolts. And he's like, no, nah. why would have I touched them? He goes, I just pulled it out, put it in the back of the car. I'm going to give this a quick wipe with some brake cleaner. I'll show it to you before I, before I wipe it, if it'll... Um, it looks very, very clean. I don't know how familiar any of you are with Loctite, but basically when you use Loctite, it, uh, it's like glue. When you Loctite a bolt in, well, when you undo it, the bolt has Loctite on it. And then what you've got to do to reuse the bolt is take it to your wire buff and clean it all up. And then, see this stuff? This is uh, Loctite, so you put that on the bolt and then you put it in there and then you do it up and then it doesn't undo. Not making any assumptions, but. Now I've said it once and I'm gonna say it again, I'm a mechanic, but I'm not a diff specialist. I haven't actually built many diffs, but I'm just gonna show you how I do it. What I would suggest is that you go and print out the manual, the workshop manual for your diff for your model car that has all of the instructions of how to build a diff. You can use my video as experience of, you know, seeing someone else do it. You might not understand what something means in here. Hopefully I can help you there. If you try and go into building a diff without one of these, it is bound to fail. This has the backlash between your gears, the bearing preload, the run out specs, everything. All the bolt torques for the main caps, that stuff is really important. And as you can see, the bolts were missing out of that diff. So. If you haven't got one of these, when you build your diff, this is what you're going to look like. Yeah, g'day guys, today I'm going to build a diff. <laughs> so firstly, I'm going to get stuck into ripping the diff down. Now don't judge me, these are my nitrile gloves, which I use for painting. 
and I'm only just gonna put these on to tear the diff down because it's covered in old diff foil and stuff. I don't wanna get that stuff on my camera. It's just easier to put gloves on. So you wanna start by taking the lockings tabs out. Now also, you shouldn't probably use a rattle gun just to undo everything like this, but I'm going to because I'm lazy. Ideally, you would get someone to hold this and crack these with a breaker bar or something rather than going straight to them with a rattle gun. Now, this is an important part. I'm just gonna grab a paint pen, put a mark on this cap here. This is just so I know which side it's from. Now, this here is a center punch, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put two little dots on both faces, and then if I accidentally wash the mark off, I'll still be able to know. You know it's just on there, so on there and on the other face, that's just where I mark. Just so I know, when I put it back together, I won't try and put that on that side. There we go. Righto, that is your differential. That's out. For those of you that don't know absolutely anything, that is the diff locker. If it's not a locker, it'll just, you know, look like this. What it's got is gears inside there. They spin around and they allow one axle to turn at a different speed to the other axle. That there is just a normal diff center. That's what you call like your diff center. And that there has been replaced with a diff locker. So it's the exact same thing. It's got gears in there that spin around, but it has a mechanism that locks it in and locks it out. This here is your crown wheel or ring gear. And these are your carab bearings, so they're just pressed on to that. In here, that is your pinion gears. That feels okay, so I was concerned that it may have uh, collapsed the crush spacer in there because it's got a crush spacer, which I'll show you very soon. Yeah, I'm gonna be a little bit rough here, but this is all getting thrown in the bins very tight. Need a bigger hammer. I'm gonna show you something. This here is called a pinion gear. The pinion gear is held into the diff with two bearings, one on this side and one where my hand is. Why it took so many hits to get it apart is because the other one's kind of pressed on to hold it together. This here is the spacer that holds the, the two bearings. So there's a bearing here and a bearing there. It holds them apart at the right gap so that it has the correct tension when you do the nut and everything up and just holds it all there exactly with no play, you know, perfect. That there, although Mac told me that it didn't have a solid spacer, that there is a solid spacer. And what you can see here, that is a shim. So you need to shim it to get it to the right tension. Just here, this is just out of a diff that I had. This is a crush tube. So this is a fully complete pinion. And I've got this together so I can show you because you know that one I've just pulled apart. Here's your flange where your tail shaft goes on. You know, you do this nut up all tight and everything does up tight. This spacer in the middle is what stops these two bearings from being over tight because they're taper roller bearings. They push into a tapered cone, which is in here. This tube is what comes factory on a Land Cruiser diff. And this tube is a crush tube. You can see it looks like it's been crushed. That's why. So Basically to set one of these up, you just put it all together and you just do it up and you feel all your tension and you measure it, whatever. You do it up a bit more, it gets a bit tighter, you know. It's pretty foolproof. You can adjust this by how much that crushes. With this style, this is a solid spacer. So think you replace that with a solid bit of stuff that doesn't crush and you have to use shims. These are my shims that I've got, multiple ones in a bag to try to set it up correctly. Now this could take, you'll see it soon, could take a few goes. There is no guarantees to get this right the first time. If you've done a few of them, you might be able to guess what you need. But anyway, it looks like there is also shims in here and those shims move your pinion. Let's come over here. Your pinion gear has to mesh with the ring gear. And with these shims in here behind this bearing, between the gear and the bearing, that pushes it in or out. Now, depending on how far in or out the pinion is, that puts an impact on your tooth contact between these teeth and these teeth, which we'll talk about later. I just wanted to show you. Oh, yes. That is the other pinion bearing, the outer smaller bearing. Right Righto, for the next step, you're just gonna bear with me while I punch a couple of cones. Feel better now. 
Now that the bearing cones are removed, we're gonna clean this up, ready for the new parts. Okay, so before I do anything, I'm gonna run you through the parts that I'm using. These are the diff gears, so that's a new crown wheel and that's a new pinion. These are a nitro gear and they're a 4.88 ratio. Diff locks. I've gone with a Harap E locker. In my gold 79, I actually have an ARB air locker in the rear and I have a TJM Pro locker in the front. Have had a couple of little issues with the rear one. Anyway, I've got a Harap E locker to put in to Baz, one for the front, one for the rear. These are called an E locker because they're electric, not air. So basically what that means is on my 79, whenever I wanna put the locker in, I have to flick on the compressor wait for it to build up air and then once it's built up air i'm able to use the locker now don't have to do that with this this is an e-locker so as soon as you put power into it it's locked as soon as you take power out it's unlocked so that is the advantage also i don't need to have a compressor you could just have a little portable compressor that's for your tires you don't have to have a permanently set up compressor to use one of these i'm really keen to give these a go and see how they work I just want to show you this. This here is a Harap E-Locker. This is the diff center out of Mac Preston's with the smash gears that I just had a look at and pulled apart. Now, as you can see, these gears are broken and we don't know if that was from the crown wheel bolts or if it was just from having too much power, but this has been and done all the hardest tracks in Tasmania. It's been to the high country, it's been to Fraser Island, it got flogged and he even blew up a diff and didn't break the front locker either. It's been flogged up glassy. It's been, all I'm trying to say is, it hasn't broken, it hasn't had a single drama. It's literally blown the diff and the center is still all right. It's not locked up in there, everything still works. So I'll let you be the judge of the strength of a Harrop locker. Find out when I'll put them in bars. Oh, g'day guys. We're gonna do a bit of a bloody an unboxing here. In the Harrop box, you get a bag of wires and switches and stuff. I won't be needing right now. A piece of cardboard, which I also won't be needing. A diff lock. This is the bit that I actually need to assemble this to carrier bearings. What I have here is a bit of foam, a new crown wheel for big bad baz. This here, my new pinion gear, let's just go off the splines, 33 millimeters diameter this. This here is a pinion that I've pulled out of an 80 series diff. This is a standard 80 series Land Cruiser pinion. That there is about 27 and a half mil. Put any decent power through them, they just snap. I'm going to just show you this here. You're going to be able to hopefully see this on the camera. The one on that side is an 80 series. The one on that side is a 105 or a 79 series. And that is a big difference. Hmm, I like that. Now there is one small little issue here. I'm two bolts short because they actually rattled out a max diff and I'm pretty sure they went through the gears. This is kind of how it is when you live in Emu and you just want to get things done. I can't just duck down the shops and get another one even if the, they'd probably be shut right now. But you know, I can't even jump on Facebook Marketplace. No one lives here, so I just got to work this out on my own. So when I installed the ring gear, I was very particular about how I lined all of these holes up. A problem that you'll have is the ring gear is very tight. You're supposed to warm it up, you know, you could use an oven or a heat gun or boiling water, whatever, to try and make it a little bit easier to get on. But basically, once you're going on, you can't turn it. So all the holes were lined up as best as possible. Hit it on a bit, tried a couple of bolts and they wanted to start. So I just kept going and sent her home. And yeah, these are all screwing in with my fingers very easily, which is what you want. Okay, so now when it comes to doing up these crown wheel bolts, these are a two stage tension. So the first setting is one ugga dugga. So I'm just gonna go and do that now. All right, so now they're all talks to one ugga dugga. I'm gonna go around and talk them to 137 Newton meters, which is what it says in the book. The torque setting for these is 137 Newton meters, but I'm not just gonna go and click the first one off to that because I want them to all be, you know, seated properly. I've bashed this on with a copper punch and, you know, I want it to be right before I go and crank all the bolts up. So I'm just gonna go around by feel and just half do them up. 137 Newton meters is fairly tight. So this is probably only halfway to that. The workshop, manual doesn't say to do this but my mechanical brain tells me to do this the manual also doesn't have a pattern in which you should go around these it literally just says to do them up to 137 newton meters but my 
mechanical brain wants to do them in a crisscross pattern, just like doing up a wheel or anything else. Essentially, what we're doing now is pulling the gear onto the locker or the diff assembly, whatever you want to call it. And we want to pull it on square. Now, I'm going to be marking every one of these with a paint pen. This is just so I know 100% that they are tension. Also, because I'm going in a bit of a crisscross pattern, it is a little bit harder to remember where I was last. It doesn't really matter if putting those two bolts in is the last job I do, as long as they go in before it goes in the car. Right, oh, no, so having a quick look here, this is obviously the pinion, I've got the bearing pressed onto it. These here are shims. Yeah, there's four in this bag that come with the training tamer kit, and these are two that I had just laying around from last time. Last time that I built a diff exactly the same as this, it didn't require any shims at all. I actually put this spacer in, done it all up, and it was right. So what I'm gonna do today is put that on there, do it all up, and see what it does, because there's no point just putting a shim on if I don't even know if it needs to be shimmed. So there's no right or wrong way to do this. It is simply trial and error. You just gotta put it in there, do it up, and see what it does like um if it's too tight you need to add a shim if it's too loose you need to remove a shim but if you start with nothing it's probably the best way to work it out now this here is a new flange from terrain tamer and this is the other pinion bearing i've also got a new nut here the first thing that i'm going to do before i go and put all this together is i'm going to use a little bit of my liquid grease in this bottle this isn't actually lucas hub oil for you diesel mechanic guys out there we just simply use the bottle and it's like a mobile liquid grease doesn't matter it just it's always sitting on the bench here so i just like to use it to assemble things i just really want to put a bit on there just you know because i'm going to be putting this all together and i'm going to be doing it up really tight possibly too tight if it needs to be shimmed i don't want this to be grinding in there all dry also a bit on this thread here won't hurt at all and you know what i might even put a bit around the splines now i've also got a new seal here and an oil slinger ring this is a genuine Toyota replacement because the diff that I was going to rebuild had the 27mm pinion shaft in it and this is for a 33mm one so I just got a brand new one off Toyota. But I'm going to leave these sitting on the bench because these will go in at the finish when I'm happy with everything. You can do this two ways, you can use a press or you can use a hammer. Now for the purpose of this video it's a little bit hard to try and film it over at the press. I also don't have all the right attachments and it's going to be a lot of mucking around. And I know that I can give this a few bangs with a hammer and do the nut up and it'll be sweet. So that's the way that I'm going to do it. Now I'm going to be using this nylon face hammer to bash this on. The last one I done, I used a real hammer and it dinted it all up. It's nice and new, it looks good, I don't want that. So essentially what you just watched there is me pressing the bearing on with a nylon hammer. So the other way that you could do that is try and support it up in under here and try and push on here or turn it up the other way and push the pinion in and support that there. So now I need to put this in here. Now I want to try and go bit by bit if I can because I don't know if this is going to be over tight with no shims in it or it might be just right, who knows. Still loose. Okay, that is tight. You know what, that feels really, really good. Okay, the next tool that I've got, this here is a quarter inch tension wrench. It ranges from one Newton meters to nine Newton meters. It's also got inch pounds on it, but I'm not gonna use that because the book says Newton meters. What the book says is that the, the bearing preload, when you put this on and turn it around, needs to be between 1.3 and 1.8 Newton meters, which is like that much, like it's, not, it's bugger all. So. Now, another quick thing with this measurement of the pinion bearing preload is, when I say, and in the book, what it says here is 1.3 to 1.8 Newton meters, well, that is for a new bearing. So if you are measuring an old bearing, or you know, one that's done a few Ks, the spec for it's only a 0.64 to 0.9. So, you know, as this is 1.3 to 1.8. So it's twice, it's twice as much. It's another whole Newton meter. And so, yeah, that is the difference between a new bearing and an old bearing. This bearing, when it goes down the road, hundred miles an hour on gate, is gonna bloody bed in and then it'll be sweet anyway. So if anything, you probably better be on the tight side of the tolerance than the loose side, because it's gonna wear in and become loose anyway. Righto. So basically you can see here on the gauge, that's pushing about three Newton meters there. Um, there's a spot around here where it's pushing about two. And yeah, there's a little bit of a stiff spot in it. It's a new bearing, it's got oil and stuff in it. 
I'm pretty happy with that. I reckon if I was to sit there and spin it 20 times with a rattle gun, I reckon it'd be under two. All right, for the sake of it, because it's rating three Newton meters and it's supposed to be between 1.3 and 1.8, I'm gonna show you how to adjust that, so. I'm gonna go for a walk. I'm gonna take this to the press and I'm gonna press this back out. Because it's so close, I'm gonna try and find my smallest shim to put in here. 0 0.2 0 .2 of a millimeter. That one's 0 0.4, that one's 0 0.2, 0 0.1. So there you go, I started with a 0 0.2 that I thought was the smallest, that one's smaller. What is this bad boy? That one's like 0 0.15, that one's 0 0.5. So I'm gonna go with this one, that's my smallest one, 0 0.1 millimeters. So I'm gonna drop that. This is where it's gonna go on there, and then my crush spacer is gonna go on there. I'm gonna say it's too loose. I shouldn't be able to spin it that quick. Like I said before, it felt right, but it was just a little bit out on the, on the measuring tool, you know? It was just a little bit out, but I said that it felt right, and it was very close. This time I'm saying that it feels wrong, it's too loose. So this is what 0 0.1 mil shim done to it. Doesn't even move. It does not move, not even a tiny bit. And just like I said, it's a little bit of a trial and error to work out what's gonna work and what's not. And I actually had it right the first time, as close as I'm gonna get it to right. I'm not gonna ring up Terrain Tamer and ask them to send me a, a 0 0.05 millimeter shim and have this sitting here all week just for that. Like it's the rating that I got before is not right, but I could guarantee you after it goes for a drive down the road, it'll be right. So you just know the drill, you just know what I'm gonna do here because you just watch it. So I'm gonna speed this bit up for you so you don't have to watch me do the whole thing again. Let's just slow it down for a second. How about I put the pinion seal in this time? I know it's gonna be right. Something that's very easy to forget to put in is this oil slinger. Now on the rear diff, I don't know why, don't ask me why, but it's literally just a flat washer. I don't understand how that slings oil. On the front diff, the slinger looks like that. That looks, that looks to me like something that'd sling around oil. But anyway, that's what it has. Now, the reason why I hold this up and say that it's so important to put in because this is meant to be the oil slinger, oil pump oil thing that makes the oil go in the bearings. So if you don't put it in, the bearings may not get oil. So very important to put it in. Now, before you go installing your seal, you wanna make sure that it fits nice onto the flange. The finished product, bird over nut, new nut. New flange, new seal, feels good. I'm gonna call that near enough. So the situation is getting better. We're actually only one bolt short. Although we only just found those loose bolts in Max Diff before, I obviously found it as soon as I got the diff. There was one missing then, so. I thought it was weird because I'm like, I swear there was only one bolt missing, not two. And I wanna know from you guys in the comments, what do you reckon? I want the verdict. Do you reckon this here is from one bolt falling out and going through the teeth? Surely, some of you are mechanics, not that it really matters, just when something goes wrong, I wanna know why, so I don't make that mistake myself. This one bolt here, I'm gonna be able to put that in later, so fingers crossed, I reckon Terrain Tamer or Toyota will be able to sell me another one of those bolts. Oh. This little plate is just zip tied on. What you're gonna see here is a very, very professional set of tools. This is three screwdrivers. And what I'm gonna do with these is I'm gonna build my diff with them. So to do these nuts up and undo them, you can actually buy a spanner. It's like a piece of flat with two little prongs on it. Because I'm just a backyard diff builder, I just use three screwdrivers. To be completely honest, I was gonna make a tool for the purpose of this video. I was gonna get a piece of flat and then I was gonna weld two bolts to it. The purpose of this video is for me to show you how I build a diff. And all the diffs I've ever built, I've used screwdrivers. So like a wheel bearing, I like to do it up all the way. So everything's seated nicely. Then back it off. The correct procedure for setting these carrier bearing preload is to set it to zero. So what that means is just think of it like when you do it up, you get to that point where it, ooh, if you go any further, it's tight. 
but if you go back it's loose that bit in between loose and tight that is zero preload now the way to actually professionally measure this on a diff is to get one of these magnetic dial gauges now this magnetic dial gauge come from ebay i don't know how much it was but it wasn't much you put the prong of the dial gauge onto the end of the bearing like that and then you grab hold of this and you move it backwards and forth and you watch the little thing going like that on the gauge what you want to do is to nip the nut up so you just got to try and guess where zero is basically but i'm just going to do this up by feel so so this is loose right here one finger and then boom there's about you know probably just past zero that's probably about the tension where it needs to be at the finish that has got a lot of backlash so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn that half a turn and I'm going to turn this one in half a turn. Now what this does is it moves the crown wheel closer to the pinion to take up the play in the gears. The teeth are on this side, the pinion's in there, it's on this side. So if I move this whole thing this way, the teeth are going to get closer together and be tighter and have less play in them. I unscrewed this nut out and I screwed that one in and it just moved it over. And now it has less play, but it's still too much. That's very close to being right. When it comes to setting these carrier bearings, you have to remember that this little locking tab has to lock into a hole. I can't put that in there. So it has to be tighter or looser. I'll just go back half of a hole. So now that locking tab can go in the hole. Now that I've got it close, I wanna actually set the bearing preload. I reckon that's about zero there. From the zero preload position, the workshop manual says that you need to tighten it up one to 1.5 notches. So each little notch that that locking tab locks into, you need to go one to 1.5. Where this currently is, it's in between two of the holes. So I can either go half or I can go one and a half. So I'm probably gonna be one and a half. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna put a little mark on this. I'm gonna put this in here and I'm gonna loosen it off. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm not gonna close my eyes, but I'm gonna look over there and I'm just gonna do it up if I feel. Back it off again. I'll show you. So that's my little mark, and I'm probably a little bit past. That's just where it feels right to me. And going off the actual proper procedure, that's where it's meant to be anyway. It's not that finer of an increment. So if I was to go one notch looser, it'd be pretty loose. And if I was to go one notch tighter, it'd be pretty tight. If I was to back it off, and come back to this hole here, that would be too loose. So the way that I'm guessing that, it's nothing crazy. It's not that finer of an adjustment. If you one notch out, it'll be a fair bit wrong. Now this backlash, there's only one way to check if it's right. Now you can see this needle here is flicking back and forwards between two numbers. That measurement between those two is how much backlash is in this diff. So it's the, the rotational measurement <laughs> of play between the teeth. The measurement that it's reading there is 0.23 of a millimeter. Now that's slightly over what it's meant to be. It's got to be between 0.13 and 0.18 of a millimeter. So it's just, it's just over that 0.23 is too much. The only option I've got is to screw this nut in one tooth and to screw this nut out one tooth and move it this way closer to the gear one tooth of the adjusting rings. That's all I've got, and that's, I think, all it'll take. Whoop. One tooth. It's gonna get my paint pen. Just in case it does a runner on me and I forget where I was. So it's going from 66 to 80. 66, 80. So what that means is it's got 0 0.14 millimeters of backlash between those two lines here is 0.14 mil. What it has to be in the book is between 0.13 and 0.18, and it's 0.14, so that's within the specifications, and it's on the, it's on the tighter end of it too, and these are brand new gears and everything, so that's where it should be. I'm by no means a diff professional. I haven't done many of this. This is my, uh, oh, this is probably like the fifth one that I've set up like this, but not fully rebuilt with solid spaces and everything. You know, just fitting lockers and stuff, and they're all been in my own cars, and none of them have ever failed. So, yeah, this is the stuff that I'm going to be using to check the tooth contact. It's called Persian Blue. 
This stuff's used for uh, checking clearances and stuff between two metal components, basically. This is what it looks like when it's painted with the Persian blue. It's just solid blue and what it's meant to do is when I run the, the gears through each other, it'll, it'll show me how these teeth are meshing, so. I drew a little picture here on my front diff because what was happening was the tooth was contacting out here on the end, uh, which is called the toe. And I just wanted to show, basically on a tooth, this is what they'll teach any mechanic at trade school. So I learned this a few years ago when I was uh, at trade school to be a diesel mechanic, but just think this is the crown wheel here. This is the middle of the crown wheel. This edge of the tooth is called the heel. Down in there is called the flank. Then this inner side edge is called the toe. The outside face is called the face. Now, when I set up my front diff just before, it was meshing on the toe. There's a little spacer that goes on between the pinion and the first bearing. Well, it's basically a washer. And I had to unpress the bearings off the original old pinion from the diff that I rebuilt and get that little washer and put it in there so it would contact better. When it comes to the tooth contact, you want it to just be in the middle. It's as simple as that. That is nice. Now, I forgot to hit record on the camera, but I just went around and tensioned these main caps. They were to 83 Newton meters. That's just what the Toyota book says. Um, and then I put these little locking tabs in and I've done them up. Whoa. So that there is the finished product. That is a fully built Land Cruiser diff. The strongest possible way that you could build it with off the shelf parts. I'm sure there's some Jabai spec gears or whatever that you can probably get. But you know, this is just regularly available stuff that you can just buy from shops. And that's pretty well the strongest way that you can do it. Whoa. That's the front one. All built, brand new. This one's all pretty well ready to go. That is two nice looking diffs if I've ever seen a nice looking diff. I rang up Train Tamer and asked for one crown wheel bolt and they have delivered. And left me a cheeky little note. Tano's MK and Train Tamer boys. Keep checking those fences. If it wasn't for you boys, I wouldn't be able to check the fences. So thank you very much. Oh, I'm not here this step. So I've already uh, half prepared this and I've gone and cleaned everything up so I can just slap them in. <laughs> That's good, that fits. We are cooking with gas now. I'm ready for a tail shaft and another one between there and there. So yeah, time to get some tail shafts. This episode was supposed to be for just diffs and that's what I've done. I've built them and I've yeah, put them in there. So what you can expect from the next episodes, I need to make some brake lines and they need to be hard lines down these chassis. Also gonna make hard brake lines on the diff, put the fuel tank in. I wanna make hard fuel lines up the chassis. So all of that kind of stuff, me making custom brake lines, flaring the ends, putting all the nuts on. Once again, I'm not a brake pipe professional, but I'm happy to show you how I do it. So yeah, expect that in the following episodes. You'll notice this has got no bump stops. Hydro bumps, I've been waiting for them and I think that I've got some coming now. So unfortunately, I'm gonna have to knock a little bit of this nice shiny paint off. It'll be on the inside on this back here so you won't really see it anyway. Keen to show you how I set them up. These resis, they need a home. So I've got to make some form of mount for them, front and rear and coils are coming very, very soon. I'm gonna walk you through how I set up all my steering and stuff like that. So yeah, look forward to that in the coming episodes, but yeah, thanks for sticking around in this one. And once again, I appreciate all your support on all these videos, all of your likes, all of your comments, they mean a lot to me. So yeah, they're what helps motivate me to make more of these videos. As long as you guys keep supporting me, I'm gonna keep pumping out these kind of videos and hopefully I can run you through this entire build until I get it running. And then we're gonna take it out on the tracks and start driving it. So yeah, stay tuned for more. Make sure you subscribe and thanks again so much.